For the first one, we have functionality. And before we can even get into functionality properly, we need to look at two things first. Does the code run? And then does the code work? The code running does not mean the code is working, does not mean it's functional. The code running simply means that when you run the Python file, it doesn't crash. There's not a big red error at the bottom of the screen saying you left this out. This is an error because these values don't match. This is supposed to be a string. You gave it an integer. That's what the code running means. It means that when you run it or when you execute it, there are no errors and it maybe shows the first line of what it's supposed to show. That's what running is. It working is something completely different. Let's say we had a list of, I don't know, five things that that needed to be completed. The functionality is going to be linked to those five things. So whatever your criteria is for your piece of program, this is why me going over the current one that's in this one probably doesn't make sense because by the time you're watching this as someone who's watching this um, after September 2024, then you're most likely, definitely I would say, going to have a completely different scenario. The only things that might remain the same is probably going to be Python 3. You're probably going to have a CSV file. You're probably going to have to import it using data frames in Pandas or Matplotlib or whatever it is. So those those things are going to remain the same. However, the functionality is you're going to sit down, read the requirements again and again and again and again, and make sure, ensure that whatever you're programming, whatever you're doing is linked to those requirements. Don't just do things randomly because you think it's nice to do, unless you're doing it. If I scroll down here quickly, unless you're doing it for the user experience, don't just go in and do things because you think that's what needs to be done. Look at the requirements and focus on programming things directly to the requirements. I'm going to read the most wordy one here. It's says the solution implements mostly functional code, but code may lack efficiency and some minor errors still persist. So even if you have some errors in your code, some mistakes in your code, once they're not major errors, and I would class a major error as something, for example, a code breaking error. So I don't know, you ask a person to enter their name, they entered one, two, three, they press enter, the code crashes. That's probably a major error in my opinion. Another major error would be if you're supposed to do some form of calculation in your code. Say, so let's say, the total is £1,000. You're supposed to work out for some discount or something, 10% of the £1,000. But for some reason, it comes up as either £1,000 as a final output or one, which is very different from the 10% of the 1000 So it throws the whole total off. The business is going to lose money. So because a business might lose money, that's that, again, and this is just my opinion, that's going to be a major fault. A minor fault might be some something like you missed out a decimal point, you put a wrong symbol in. Next, we have logic and programming structures. This is, I think, probably one of the easier ones to get because again it's only three marks logic is does it follow some sensible logic does it work it's kind of linked to functionality as well but does it work if i follow your program if i trace your program does it or is it going to give me a some sensible output and programming structures again probably the simplest one there you need to have sequences you need to have selection and you need to have iteration if you don't know what these things are google programming structures then figure out what I would do is seek um, Google, for example, sequencing in Python, selection in Python, iteration in Python. Sequence is quite simple. Sequence is do line one, then line two, then line three, then four, then five, all the way up to whenever you need it to stop. Selection is probably going to be the simplest way to do it is an if statement. If this value, then do this thing. If else, if else, that's going to be your selection, your iteration. Um, the two obvious ones that come to my mind are the for loop and a while loop. Next, we have robustness. Robust Robustness just means how good the program is at not crashing. How when something is robust, that means it's quite strong, it's quite reliable. So quite simply, how good the program is at not crashing and how correct the data is. So I made some notes here. It says the code handles common user errors. Um, once you've added some extra stuff, so don't resubmit. Or if you do this, it's, it's your choice, of course. It's not a good idea to resubmit code that you have not edited in any single way, shape or form. If you have edited something, make sure that what you've edited or added still does error handling. Make sure that what you've edited or added still has the correct data. So it's still using integers when it needs to use integers, floats, doubles, or strings when it needs to use those things. And again, those are that's three marks there. And I just Googled how to make code robust, simple terms. And this here is a decent sentence. It says robust code is programming that can handle unexpected actions and terminations gracefully, even in adverse conditions. Here are some, okay, I'm not going to read the tips. But what does that mean? That simply means, again, I think I mentioned this before. If someone, if your code asks someone for a name, so a name is going to be alphanumeric characters, so letters, and the person's name is supposed to be, I don't know, runs Tech Hub, but for some reason they enter 1234, you're supposed to check the type of data that they've entered. And if it's not, um, 
in Python, I think there's some something called is alpha, as far as I can remember. If it's not is alpha or not equal to is alpha, then say, okay, you need to enter alphabet letters or alphanumeric letters because you're asking for a name. If you've asked for someone's age or height, age is probably going to be an integer because it's just going to be a whole, most people don't say I'm 13.5 years old. They simply say I'm 13 or 21. So that's going to be an integer, a whole number. If you if you ask for height, some people might say I'm, uh, most people don't use this, but they might say I'm 1.56 meters tall. That's going to be a double. So whatever data you've been asked to enter, that's what should be entered. If it's not entered, the code shouldn't just crash. It should say, okay, what you've entered is not accepted at this point. So please enter the correct data type, for example. Another thing, probably one of the things that people will definitely do is the person just doesn't enter anything. They just keep spamming the enter button. So you can do a check, for example, saying if length of this thing that they've entered is, is nothing, then keep asking for it. So that's going to be a, for a while loop. So you need to get very, very familiar with your while loops or your for loops. Next, we have security. Security is a bit of a sticky one because most people hear the word security and think, okay, I, I need to make this particular thing safe. And the, you do need to make it safe to some degree, but not in the way you're thinking. All right, first and foremost, do not create a login system for your Python file or for your code. Do not create a system where you have to put in a username and or password to access the other sections of the code. That's not what you need to do. I repeat, do not create a username and or password login system to access anything. That is not what security means in this instance. And what is needed is secure programming practices. That's technically what I think or something along those lines, what it should be labeled as secure programming practices, not the login system. So let me go over this. So no global variables when doing your programs, different sections of the program shouldn't be able to access variables from another section relatively easily because that's how someone who's a hacker could actually get information. If they have access to every single variable in the code, then that's going to be a bad, bad thing for you. Next, we have functions and passing data. Ideally, you should have most of your code written in different functions. You shouldn't just have one massive piece of code that is just line after line after line after line. You should ideally have functions. So let's just say for argument's sake, you're trying to get details from a user. You should have maybe a get details function. Maybe you should also have a put details function where you put that into a database if that's something you're doing. So whatever thing you're doing, once you've decomposed it, each section or each module of the decomposition can be its own function. It doesn't have to be every single module, but most of it should be in functions separated from each other, local variables instead of global variables, passing the data from one function to another. So the, so function two shouldn't have access to every single piece of data in function one. What should happen is function one should have a return value, which returns only the information that's necessary for function two to work or function four or whatever number it is to work. So for example, let's say we did some random calculations. We worked out, I don't know, the percentage of whatever number has been given. We don't need to know what number has been given. We don't need, need to know the age of the person, the, the name of the person, the data, but we only need to know what percentage discount, for example, we need to apply. And the percentage discount should be passed out of function one. So function two can grab that or function three can grab that and do what it needs to do based on that value. Next, we have good error messages. Now, this can be linked to robustness and this can also be linked to user experience. However, I'm going to leave this here. You can put this in multiple places, obviously, so it doesn't just have to be for security. But I think end crashing should also be something that a good security practice. So rather than the code simply just crashing because it doesn't know what data type this is or this is not the data type that it's expecting, it should maybe output an error message saying, OK, there was an error here. I'm going to reset to this line of the code or this section of the code. So please enter your values again. Next, I have data frame or a new data frame. When you import your CSV files into your Python code, it might be done for you already in the code that you were given. So there might be a thing there called data frame, DF or data frame. I believe this is from pandas or from matplotlib. I can never remember which, which one it's from. But whenever you import your, um, your CSV into the program, you should ideally use a different data frame for every function or everything that you're trying to do. For example, you probably have a data frame in there already, which gets the data from the current CSV file. However, if you were supposed to to do something that gets a different piece of data from the same CSV file or from a different CSV file, you should use a different data frame. So every single time you have to use a data frame, you should re-import the CSV file. So just in case the data changes, you're not pulling data from the old CSV file or from broken CSV file, always use a new data frame. There are more things that can be linked to security. You can just go on Google, secure programming practices. So I'm going to copy that, go to Google, paste it, 
and you will find things on here that you can put into your code into your program to make it more secure these are the ones that I focused on here. This is not an exhaustive list. This is not all that there is. This is simply what came to my mind while I was reading this. Next, we have code organization. And the main thing is that the code should be maintainable by a third party. And the three points that they've given us are consistent naming conventions, logical organization, informative commenting. Logical organization comes in at the top somewhere as well, but it's here again. Consistent naming conventions means you follow conventions that have been designed or developed and you also follow your own conventions. So for example, if all your variables are going to have camel case, continue using camel case, don't randomly change it here and there. If it's going to be lowercase, use lowercase. But whatever the convention is that you've been taught by your teacher, that's probably what you should stick with. There is no one convention that fits every single thing. People use different things, so just use whatever your teacher recommends. Logical organization. Again, this is at the top as I mentioned. If it's logically organized, so for example, I'm going to highly suggest and recommend that people use functions in this. So the way this works, your functions must be at the very top. And then under the function, that's where you have your logic. So you say, if the person enters this, then run function one. If the person enters this, then run function two. So logical organization it simply means that it's organized in a way that's relatively easy to follow, relatively easy to trace, relatively easy to see what is happening. And finally, we have informative commenting. Quite simply, comment what you've done. You don't have to comment every single line. I've personally done that on different occasions just to get my point across on what each section is doing and how to comment. Please, you do not have to comment every single line. What I would do is maybe have a comment which spans a line or two for each section that you're doing so for example you could say um one comment could be this function does a b c and d then it passes the value a finally for this section we have user experience and if you know what user experience is this section should be relatively straightforward so we need to have user experiences provided through somewhat effective view so we need to have effective use of input handling we've mentioned this before the program shouldn't just crash if someone enters something that's not being expected if i ask for name um and the name is supposed to be runs tech hub and the person enters the number one which is an integer it shouldn't just crash we should have input handling where we check every single input that the person enters we check it against what we want so if i want to name we should have something that's more than one character and it should only be letters. And I, as I mentioned before, in Python, there's a function, a built-in function called is alpha, which check if what's been entered is from the alphabet, I believe. So you could use something like that. User guidance and error messages. Again, we had that in a previous section. User guidance. If someone enters something, so let's say I ask for name again and the name should be, I don't know, Ron, Bob, Dave, whatever it is. And the person enters the number one, two, three. The user guidance and error message should say, um, the value you've entered is not accepted please enter a name which should be only alphabet characters something along those lines and finally we have outputs the output that the program gives shouldn't be something that the person has to go and guess what does this mean what does it's supposed to be so obvious and so straightforward that once they see it they know okay this is 10 percent of the 100 pounds that that's why this value says 10 this is 10 percent of the total amount this is the discount i'm so make it super super obvious what that specific output is for or what it's linked to